Welcome to week four of Anatomy and Physiology. Last week, we considered chapter four, where we looked at the various tissues of the body. We had epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscle tissue, nervous tissue. As we move forward in our textbook, we'll also move forward with structural hierarchy by considering our first system, that of the skeletal system. In fact, this week we begin a three-week unit on the study of bones, where we'll study bone at the gross level, the microscopic level, as well as consider the chemical makeup of bone. In week five, we're going to delve into the skeleton itself, which will be more of a study on your own unit in order to identify a list of bones and bony landmarks before returning for week six with a discussion of joints in chapter eight. In this week's two-part lecture over the material in chapter six, we'll first review cartilage, focused on hyaline cartilage and fibrocartilage, but we'll also take a quick review of elastic cartilage as well. Next, we'll consider how cartilage grows. We have appositional growth, or the growth from the perichondrium, and we have interstitial growth, or growth from chondrocytes within cartilage. With a brief introduction to cartilage, we'll then move on to the function of bone, which is a review from last chapter's material. And from there, we'll see a four-part bone classification system based on the shape of a bone, and then we'll begin looking at gross anatomy of bone. We tend to focus most on long bones, those bones making up our appendages, more so than our other classifications. Once we have a firm grasp on gross anatomy, we'll move to microscopic anatomy of bone, a review from last chapter as well, and then consider the chemical makeup of bone, what contributes to the organic and inorganic substances of bone. We'll then return to our second lecture of the week, where we'll consider the ossification processes of bone, that is how bone forms in the fetus depending on the particular bone in question. We have endochondral ossification and we have intramembranous ossification. Finally, we consider postnatal bone growth from a perspective prenatally up through adolescence as well as adolescence to old age. You may recall from last week's lecture, we talked about cartilage, one of the connective tissues found in our body. The other connective tissues we discussed were blood, bone, and connective tissue proper. Recall further that connective tissue is made up of three components. We had cells unique to the tissue being discussed. In this case, when we talk about cartilage, we have chondrocytes as the mature cells responsible for the maintenance of cartilage. We have fibers as our second component. In the case of cartilage, it's made up predominantly of elastic fibers and collagen fibers. And then we have ground substance, the gel-like substance which fills the spaces between cells and fibers. A catchy little phrase, which I certainly didn't come up with myself, to help you remember these three components is cells, gels, and fibers, with gels being the ground substance. The ground substance, remember, is hydrated, making cartilage very compressible. Further, it doesn't have nervous tissue. It contains only minimal blood vessels. Thus, cartilage relies on nearby tissue for the exchange of nutrients and wastes, as well as gases. In terms of the nearby tissue, we see cartilage covered by a layer of dense irregular connective tissue that we call perichondrium. And we're going to see perichondrium here, and this is going to be an image representing dense irregular connective tissue. Again, remember, chondro and chondrium refer to cartilage. And if you keep this in mind, this is going to help you differentiate between this and some other materials we're going to see with bone coming up. As a covering, perichondrium provides resistance from expansion while cartilage is being compressed, and the perichondrium itself is vascular, thus providing cartilage the ability to obtain nutrients and gases and rid itself of wastes. In these images here at the right, we have a cross section here of the trachea at the top where we're going to see pseudostratified ciliated epithelial tissue here facing the lumen of the trachea. We're going to see then connective tissue a bit deeper hyaline cartilage here for which we're going to see these little dots are chondrocytes found in lacunae and finally this is our perichondrium and again it's made up of dense irregular connective tissue and our bottom image here in contrast this is an example of dense irregular connective tissue by which the perichondrium is composed Recall cartilage comes in three types, hyaline cartilage, elastic cartilage, and fibrocartilage. And I'll review each of these three next. First, hyaline cartilage. I like to say this is the pretty cartilage. If we go back here, this is hyaline cartilage. It has strength due to collagen fibers and resistance and resilience as a result of its ground substance. 
Recall from last chapter, we find hyaline cartilage throughout the skeletal system, at the tips of our long bones, where it has a special name called articular cartilage, at the tip of the nose, extending from the nasal bone, and in association with the anterior aspects of our ribs, where our ribs attach to the midline at the sternum or with the ribs above. Again, we have a special name for this hyaline cartilage as well, called costal cartilage. We also have elastic cartilage, the unique cartilage found only in two places. And do you remember where they're found? We talked about this last chapter. We said they're found the oracle of the ear as well as the epiglottis. We won't talk about elastic cartilage moving forward in this unit, but rather we need to keep in mind hyaline cartilage and fibrocartilage. So that brings us to fibrocartilage next. Fibrocartilage is seen in the skeletal system. It's composed of very thick collagen fibers, which provides for quite a bit of tensile strength. And with this in mind, it's found between the vertebrae, making up vertebral discs. It's found at the pubic symphysis, connecting our two hip bones or coaxial bones. And it's also found making up the menisci of the knee. Ultimately, based on these locations, fibrocartilage is responsible for protection in amidst areas of very high compression and when great strength is needed. Moving forward, and our last slide pertaining to cartilage, you'll find two terms. We have the terms appositional growth and interstitial growth, denoting the two ways by which cartilage grows. And we're going to see these two terms in association with bone growth as well. When we think about cartilage growth, we should be thinking about our blast cells, and specifically, we should be thinking about chondroblasts. In appositional growth, where we want cartilage to expand and widen, chondroblasts are found located on the surface of cartilage right underneath the perichondrium, and they secrete new extracellular matrix, causing cartilage to grow outward and expand. In contrast, and maybe more specific to some of our learning when we consider growth of long bones postnatally, we have what's called interstitial growth. In this manner, chondroblasts secrete extracellular matrix and cartilage expands from within. Again, let me reiterate, Appositional growth is where we see growth via expansion and widening. Interstitial growth is where we find growth from within to make something longer. We'll see these terms again, as I mentioned, when we consider bone growth. Now, moving along to an introduction of bones, I want to provide an introduction by discussing bone function. This material is ultimately just a repeat of what we covered in the last chapter. However, I have separated out storage into mineral and triglyceride storage. So let's go through these six functions. First, bone provides support and protection. We're going to see support of soft tissues and delicate organs while providing a framework for which muscles and their tendons attach, but it also serves in protection, protecting the body, specifically by protecting internal organs from injury. We can see this with the skull protecting the brain, our vertebrae protecting the spinal cord, as well as the components of the rib cage, our ribs, our sternum, our vertebrae, serving to protect the heart and lungs of the thoracic cavity. Bone provides for movement, specifically given skeletal muscles attach indirectly to bones. When a muscle contracts, those muscles pull on bone, serving as a pulley system to aid in locomotion. Third, bone serves as a storage sink for minerals, specifically serving as a reservoir for calcium and phosphate, and on demand under hormonal control, something we're going to learn later on in this chapter. Bone can release minerals into the blood so as to help maintain a very narrow window of concentration of certain minerals like calcium and phosphate. In turn, when those minerals are in high concentration in the blood, they can be sunk into bone. So we have this ability to store minerals like calcium and phosphate, but pull them out and we'll see how that works with this chapter. Bone also serves as a storage sink for triglycerides where triglycerides can be stored in the adipose cells of yellow marrow cavities of long bones. Fifth, bone serves as the site of blood cell formation, a term we refer to as hematopoiesis, specifically the red bone marrow of some of our flat bones and the ends of long bones help with hematopoiesis. In this manner, the red marrow of our bones provide for the production of our red blood cells or our erythrocytes, our white blood cells, sometimes referred to as leukocytes, and our platelets. Lastly, bone serves as a site of hormone production. Specifically, osteoblasts in the bone produce a hormone called osteocalcin, which helps regulate glucose in the body, amongst other activities. 
When we talk about bones, we can talk about the skeleton based on a division of the skeletal system into two functional units, and our textbook does this with our next chapter. We look at the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. When we consider the axial skeleton seen here in blue, the axial skeleton consists of about 80 bones that make up the cranium, the neck, and the trunk, including the sternum and the rib cage. And the axial skeleton is going to function to protect, to support, and carry other body parts. And we're going to look at all of these bones in our next chapter. In contrast, we also have the appendicular skeleton, which we see here with those bones found in the salmon color. The appendicular skeleton is comprised of about 126 bones of the limb, making up the pectoral and pelvic girdles and those appendages. The appendicular skeleton's main function is to provide for locomotion as well as help us manipulate our environment. Now, in contrast to dividing the skeleton into two functional parts, we can also take bones and categorize them based on their shape, where we may refer to them as long bones, short bones, flat bones, and irregular bones. First of all, our long bones. Our long bones are tubular bones, such as the humerus, the arm, the femur, or the leg. Ultimately, they are any bone in the body that's longer than it is wide. Long bones make up our limbs, including the humerus, the radius, the ulna, our metacarpals, and our phalanges of our upper limbs, and the femur, the tibia and the fibula, the metatarsals, and the phalanges of our lower limbs. Now, I have taken out of those lists our carpals, and our tarsals, which are our wrist and ankle bones, and we'll see that they have a different definition. Moving on to the short bones. Now we are going to cover our carpals and tarsals. These are cuboidal shaped bones, roughly the same length as they have width, and they're found making up the wrist and the ankle. Again, we call them carpals for our wrist bones, tarsals for our ankle bones. Third, we have what are called flat bones. Flat bones typically serve in a protective role, such as those forming the cranium that protect the brain. And then lastly, we have irregular bones. These are bones of various more complicated shapes or structures other than long, short, or flat bones. They include our vertebrae, our cossacks or the tailbone, and some of the bones of our head and neck region. Now it's worth pointing out here, we also have what's called the sesamoid bone. Although the textbook doesn't discuss sesamoid bones directly, these are often listed as a separate group of bones that develop inside tendons, such as the sesamoid bone of the knee, which we call the patella, and the sesamoid bones associated with our hands. They're generally involved with joints and serve to decrease the friction and pressure of the joint. Our textbook just gives us this four point classification system, but if you're using a different textbook, you may find a fifth point by which the sesamoid bones would be considered that fifth classification category. As we begin our study of the skeletal system in earnest, let's go ahead and we're going to consider three levels of bone structure. We have gross anatomy of bone as our first level of structure, then we're going to move to microscopic anatomy of bone before we look at the chemical structure of bone. So if you were asked what are the three levels of bone structure, you should be able to tell me that we have gross anatomy of bone, microscopic anatomy of bone, and chemical structure of bone. When we consider bone, we have two types of bone. We have compact bone, or we might call it cortical bone, as well as we have spongy bone. Sometimes it's referred to as trabecular bone. Compact bone is the dense outer layer of bone that makes a bone appear solid and smooth. In turn, spongy bone is the porous interior bone-like structure. It's lighter and less dense than compact bone. It consists of plates that we call trabeculae as well as little spike-like structures called spicules found adjacent to these irregular looking cavities that house our red bone marrow and our yellow bone marrow. Sometimes it's referred to as having a honeycomb-like appearance or a spongy appearance, hence the name spongy bone. So these are our two bone types. We can further consider gross anatomy of bone by looking at short bones, irregular bones, and flat bones. And so we're going to do that first, and then we're going to spend more time with our long bones. These bones consist of, and if we look here, these thin plates here in this middle, if we consider this a sandwich structure, we're going to see thin plates of spongy bone covered by this outer material called compact bone. In this manner, bone marrow is going to be found scattered here within this spongy bone. And we're not going to see any defined bone marrow cavities as we might find with our long bone. 
Now I'd like to introduce you to two terms, connective tissue membranes, we call the periosteum and the endosteum. Periosteum, which sounds an awful lot like perichondrium, is a connective tissue that covers the external surface of compact bone. Remember, perichondrium was dense irregular connective tissue that covered their surface of cartilage. And if you consider the prefix peri, you might be referring to a perimeter or an enclosure, and that's exactly what the periosteum does. It encloses or surrounds bone. And remember back from an earlier discussion, perichondrium is going to enclose or surround cartilage. The periosteum can be divided further into two layers, a fibrous outer layer made up of dense irregular connective tissue and an osteogenic inner layer laying right next to the bone, which holds bone cells, including osteoblasts. We also have endosteum, which is going to cover the internal bone surface of compact bone, and it houses the stem cells of bone that we call osteogenic stem cells. And an easy way to remember the difference, the prefix endo means within or inner, thus found within the inner surface of bone. Now, as we turn to the gross study of long bones, we can see long bones are made up of three parts. We have a diathesis, we have an epiphysis, and we have membranes. And we're gonna talk about the first two here and we'll look at this third one in a future slide. So three parts, diaphysis, a set of paired epiphyses, and the membranes. The diaphysis is going to be this structure here, the long tube-like structure of our long bone. It's a cylindrical main portion of the bone and it consists of a hollow cavity filled with bone marrow, referred to as the medullary cavity. We also have a pair of epiphyses here and here. We have a proximal epiphysis and a distal epiphysis with our long bones. And these appear somewhat spherically knobbed at the ends of the bone, making the bone in this area wider than at the shaft or the diaphysis. And it holds spongy bone tissue. The epiphyses are going to be covered with hyaline cartilage that we call articular cartilage, providing cushioning during movement and helps absorb stress. So we see our articular cartilage here, and we would see the same articular cartilage at our distal epiphysis. Since we're looking at this slide, I also wanna discuss some other important features before we move to the third part of the long bone. We have what's called a metiphysis, or we have metiphyses. Now these are gonna be regions here, and we would see a similar one here. These are regions in a mature bone where the diaphysis joins the epiphysis. And in growing bone, so bones that are in the process of growing, each metiphysis is going to hold an epiphyseal plate. And so that'll take me to our epiphyseal plate. Here we actually just have a little epiphyseal line, but in growing bones, we would have an epiphyseal plate here as well as one here distally. An epiphyseal plate is a layer of hyaline cartilage, which during bone growth between that birth to adolescent age, that epiphyseal plate is going to allow the diaphysis of the bone to grow in length, ultimately, again, birth through adolescence. It's often referred to as a growth plate. And when a child reaches adolescence and stops growing, that epiphyseal plate is said to close, whereby it becomes the epiphyseal line. And we'll see the epiphyseal plate with a set of slides coming up. Now, the third part of our long bones is that of our membranes. And although I'm, I'm going to refer to a future slide, let's go ahead and just mention again the periosteum and the endosteum. Periosteum is going to cover the outer shaft here with the diaphysis of the long bone. It serves as an attachment point for various tendons. And then we're going to have the endosteum, which is going to be lining the medullary cavity of these long bones. Let's go ahead now and we can consider these membranes in a bit more detail. So again, periosteum and endosteum, let's look at them in a bit more detail. And I, I know this is just a review of something we've looked at before, but let's look at them now from a long bone point of view, which makes it a little easier to understand. The periosteum, again, as I mentioned before, it's a double layered membrane covering the external surface of bone, exclusive of the area surrounding joints by which we have articular cartilage, and therefore we would see perichondrium. The periosteum is vascular and it contains nerve fibers, and those vessels and nerves are ultimately going to to pierce the shaft of the bone through openings that we call nutrient foramen, thus providing bone with blood supply and nerve supply. As mentioned earlier, the periosteum provides for anchoring points of tendons and in some case ligaments and is made up of two layers, that fibrous layer and the osteogenic layer. And we just discussed these a couple of slides ago, so I won't go into that in more detail. 
let's go ahead and consider the endosteum. The endosteum is a more delicate connective tissue, and it would be covering this internal surface here. If we have the medullary cavity running longitudinally along the diaphysis of this long bone, the endosteum is going to be lining the internal surface of the bone. And in addition to that, as we have vasculature and nerve fibers running, from the periosteum into bone, we're going to see that the endosteum also is going to line those foramen. So when we said that we had those nutrient foramen earlier, we will see endosteum line those nutrient foramen. Moving inward, we're going to now consider the hematopoietic tissue of our long bones, the tissue responsible for producing blood cells, including red blood cells, white blood cells, and the megakaryocytes, which go on to make platelets. I'm not sure about your education, but somehow I grew up thinking that red bone marrow filled our long bones. And it wasn't until I was in college that I was taught about the location of our hematopoietic stem cells in terms of that tissue. In adults, we generally don't find red bone marrow in the medullary cavities of our long bones, but rather we find yellow marrow there. Instead, red bone marrow is found within the cavities of spongy bone of our flat and irregular bones, as well as just the heads of our given long bones. Now, when we talk about hematopoiesis generally, that is the production of blood cells, but there are three types of activities or events that actually take place. We can produce red blood cells, that process we call erythropoiesis, because red blood cells are more technically called erythrocytes. We have the production of white blood cells called leukopoiesis. Again, that term is used because our white blood cells are more scientifically named leukocytes. And then finally, we have thrombopoiesis, or the production of the megakaryocytes, which lend to platelets. And that term is referred based on the term thrombocytes, which are what platelets are more scientifically called. We move from cavities and tissues in our study of gross anatomy to consider bone markings. The surface features of bones vary considerably, and they're going to depend on the function of a surface and the location of the bone in the body. And so with this in mind, we talk about bone markings and landmarks. Using three general terms, we're going to see projections, we're going to see surfaces that help form joints, as well as we're going to see openings and depressions. So three types of markings, projections, joint surfaces, and depressions and openings. First, let's go ahead and consider projections. Projections are the area of a bone that projects above the surface of the bone, somewhat like an outward bulge. We have a, maybe a very smooth bone and then we have some bulging surface. That is the projection. Or it might be some other form of modification. Generally, projections are important attachment points for tendons and ligaments. We have various examples of projections. We have tuberosities, which are large rounded processes or projections with a rough surface. One example is the radial tuberosity that's a point of insertion for the biceps tendon, and you'll learn about that particular tuberosity in Chapter 7. We have crests. Crests are prominent narrow ridges on a bone, and we have, for instance, the iliac crest of the hip bone. This provides a point of origin for some of our hip flexors, as well as an insertion point for some of our abdominal muscles, and you'll see the iliac crest in chapter seven. We have trochanters, a large, blunt, irregular projection on the femur, and the greater trochanter of the femur serves as a point of insertion for some of the gluteal muscles, which help abduct and medially rotate the thigh. We have tubercles. Tubercles are small, rounded projections or processes, and the greater tubercle, the humerus, is an example, which serves as an attachment point for some of our rotator cuff muscles, which help stabilize and move the shoulder. We have epicondyles. Epicondyles are raised areas on or above a condyle. And for instance, the lateral epicondyle of the humerus provides a point of origin for muscles that are involved with the extension of the wrist. We have spines, sharp, slender, pointed projections of bone. And one of those spines is the nasal spine. It's a protrusion of the maxilla at the base of the nose. We have processes, any bony prominence. And one particular example are the spinous processes making up the vertebrae, which serve as attachment points for the tendons of various muscles that help us with posture. And lastly, we have lines. Lines are just a narrow ridge of bone. They're less prominent than crests. 
One particular example is the linea aspera of the femur, which provides a longitudinal ridge and an insertion point for the adductors that are responsible for bringing the femur back to the midline position. This slide provides a table from our textbook listing out some of the various projections, and I've just discussed those. And this slide here is going to provide examples of projections taken from slides from the PAL site, and these should help you with your studies. We further have bone markings that go on to provide surfaces that help form joints. These are bony expansions. I like to call them round or more knob-like in nature, connected by oftentimes a very narrow neck, and I'll show you what I mean in a moment. They're generally smooth, and the articular surface itself may be somewhat flat, depending on the joint in question. Now, surfaces that help form joints could be referred to as heads, as facets, and as condyles. The head is a bony expansion typically carried by a narrow neck. We're going to see the proximal head of the femur that's going to articulate with the acetabulum of our hip. Facets, these are smooth, nearly flat articular surface joints. And an example of that, we have an articular facet for the head of the fibula. Lastly, we have the condyle, a rounded articular projection or protuberance. We have both a lateral and medial condyle of the distal end of the femur that helps form an articulation point with the proximal end of the tibia at our knee joint. The table from this slide comes from our textbook listing the various types of surfaces that help form joints, again, heads, facets, and condyles. And then this set of images in this slide provides examples of surfaces forming joints taken from the slides from our PAL site. Finally, we have depressions and openings commonly used as a passageway for nerves or vessels or that might otherwise play a role in joint articulation. Let's go ahead and consider our depressions first, which we see the fossa. The fossa is just a shallow depression in bone. We're going to see when we look at our humerus, we have a coronoid fossa of the humerus, which receives the coronoid process of the proximal end of the ulna to help aid in flexion of the forearm. We have grooves. Grooves are just shallow depressions or furrows in bone that are used to route vessels or nerves. We are going to see when we move to the respiratory system in our third term of anatomy and physiology, we have costal grooves that provide a space between ribs to house the intercostal vessels and nerves. We also have notches. Notches are simply indentations or depressions at the edge of a structure, at the edge of a bone. And so we're going to see we'll have a trochlear notch of the ulna that helps create one aspect of the elbow joint to aid in flexion. And the trochlear notch of the ulna is going to articulate with the humerus. When we look at openings, we're going to have three different examples of openings, fissures, foramen, and meatuses, as I mentioned. Fissures are narrow, cleft-like openings or passageways for vessels or nerves. And when we look at the bones making up the orbit of the eye, we actually will see a superior orbital fissure just located superior to the eyebrow, which is going to allow for the passage of a handful of cranial nerves as well as some vessels. We have foramen. These are round or oval openings through bone, and the, the one everyone should be familiar with is the foramen magnum, which is the opening of the occipital bone that allows for the passage of the spinal cord leaving the brain. And then lastly, we have meatuses. The meatuses, these are just canals through bone, and the most obvious one everyone should be familiar with is the external auditory meatus, which conducts sound waves from our external environment along to the tympanic membrane that separates middle ear from outer ear. This table from our textbook and this slide is going to provide for the various types of depressions and openings. And this group of slides is taken from the PAL site, providing examples of depressions and openings from the skull, the scapula, and the humerus. We move now from gross anatomy to microscopic anatomy, so the second of the three levels of bone structure. In our discussion from last chapter, where we talked about bones and our study of tissue types, you may recall we talked about three major cell types present in bone tissue, osteoblasts, osteoclasts, and osteocytes. As we review the microscopic anatomy of bone now, I'm going to add to that list of bone cells we find. However, those first three that we talked about are the most significant for you to remember. 
In terms of stem cells, we have what's called the osteogenic cell, osteogenic stem cell. Maybe it's referred to as osteoprogenitor cells, depending on the textbook you're using. These are undifferentiated pluripotent stem cells that are derived from the mesenchyme. Remember, mesenchyme was part of the mesoderm and the tissue by which our connective tissue formed. As stem cells, these cells are capable of creating our bone-forming osteoblasts as well as our bone-destroying osteoclasts. So osteogenic cells go on to produce osteoblasts and osteoclasts. We also have osteoblasts, and remember, their main function is to synthesize, secrete, deposit organic components of the new bone matrix. And we've been calling this bone matrix extracellular matrix but generally, extracellular matrix for bone is specifically called osteoid. So you might come across that term. Further, we have osteocytes, the mature cells found in bone that we've discussed. And remember, osteocytes are trapped in their surrounding bone matrix, lying within cavities called lacunae. They communicate with other osteocytes via canaliculi. They're responsible for monitoring and maintaining bone, as well as acting as sensors to detect stress or strain. They communicate with osteoblasts, as well as osteoclasts, to build up or break down bone, depending on the mineral needs of the body. Now this is a new one. We have what are called bone lining cells found on the bone surfaces that help maintain bone matrix. Because we have two bone surfaces, an internal and an external surface, of course, we're going to have two groups of bone lining cells called periosteal cells and endosteal cells. Remember, peri means outside or surrounding, endo means inside. Periosteal cells are fine lining the external bone surface just deep to the periosteum. So we would have the periosteum wrapping around bone. And then right underneath that, we would have these bone lining cells, the periosteal cells. Our endosteal cells will be found interior within this medullary cavity just deep to the endosteum. Lastly, we have our osteoclasts. Remember, these were large and they're multinucleated cells whose main function it is to resorb and remodel bone. In layman's terms, they use acids and enzymes to break down bone when we need to divert minerals, specifically calcium, elsewhere in the body. In addition to the various cells found in bone, we have some other important microscopic features to consider, which we reviewed in our last chapter, but let's go ahead and review them again, as you can expect to see these come up both for the lecture exam material as well as lab exam material. First, we have what's called the osteon. The osteon is a long cylinder. These are long cylinders of calcified bone that run parallel to the long axis of a diaphysis. You'll remember they appeared as several concentric rings of bone, which we call concentric laminae, laid down by osteoblasts surrounding a hollow middle cavity called the central or the haversian canal. We said the osteon is the structural unit of compact bone. And so here, this would be one osteon. We see these concentric rings, and most often there are many, many, many layers of concentric rings that look like rings of a tree. In this next slide, we see the center of the osteon, a longitudinal channel we call the central canal, sometimes called the haversian canal. And so we see that canal here, we see it here, we see it here, right here, right here. This is our central or haversian canal. We also have another group of canals with terminology new to us. Specifically, we have what are called perforating or Volkmann's canals, which occur at right angles to the central canal and connect the vessels and nerves of the periosteum to the central canal. We also find lacunae. Remember, lacunae were these small little empty spaces within the lamellae that actually house osteocytes, so they're cavities that house those mature bone cells called osteocytes, which we see as these little black hatch marks along here. Further recall, I mentioned last week that during the time of bone development, that is, we're ossifying bone, Osteoblasts are hard at work laying down bone matrix, and as that occurs, osteoblasts surround themselves with bone matrix, and once they become trapped, they transform into those monitoring mature cells called the osteocytes. So those cells, the osteocytes, then spend the rest of their lives in these little pockets that we call lacunae. Lacunae are connected by canaliculi, allowing for the osteocytes to obtain nutrients, to rid themselves of wastes, to exchange gases, further canaliculi allow osteocytes to communicate with one another.
As it pertains to lamellae, recall osteons are made up of a series of concentric circles, which we were to see here, a variety of concentric circles, or we see here. Now, those concentric circles are arranged like rings of a tree around haversian canals that run longitudinally with collagen fibers and bone salt crystals packed in between. But there are two additional types of lamellae we should include in our discussion now. So these are some new terms. We have interstitial lamellae and we have circumferential lamellae. As compared to the concentric lamellae encircling the central canal, interstitial laminae are remnants of old osteons that have been broke down by osteoclasts. Thus, they're going to appear to fill in gaps. And we might see a little bit of that right here, or we could potentially see a little bit of it right here. We don't see a lot of it in this image. We see some nice, beautiful concentric lamellae here, but we would see interstitial filling in the spaces between osteons. In addition, we have circumferential lamellae found just deep to the periosteum. And circumferential lamellae are going to actually wrap themselves around the entire bone, the entire surface of the diaphysis, to prevent long bones from twisting. Let's go ahead and turn to a brief microscopic study of the anatomy of spongy bone. Recall, spongy bone is characterized by thin plates and by slivers or spike-like pieces of bone creating that honeycomb-like structure or appearance deep to compact bone. Those thin plates of bone are called trabeculae and the little slivers are called spicules. Spongy bone appears poorly organized and irregularly arranged because we don't see osteons like we saw with our compact bone. However, the spongy bone is found precisely oriented along lines of stress, so bone stressors, helping bone transfer force without breaking. Let's actually go ahead and look at another slide here where we're going to see the anatomy of that or the microscopic anatomy of that and so here we would see these nice trabeculae and trabeculae we don't see osteons here we don't see a central canal but we do still see lamellae so we see those concentric rings we don't have a central canal but we do see concentric rings and we are going to find still lacunae that are going to be filled with osteocytes Moving away from the microscopic view of bone structure, let's just go ahead and very briefly consider the third level of bone structure, and that is chemical composition. Bone is made up of both organic and inorganic substances. Organically, bone consists of living cells, as well as the osteoid and the collagen fibers secreted by osteoblasts. Organic structure helps resist tension in bone. We also have inorganic substances. Inorganically, bone is composed of mineral salts, calcium and phosphate, which has a special name that we call hydroxyapatite, and that's going to pack tightly surrounding collagen. But there are some other minerals involved, fluoride, sodium, potassium, and magnesium, amongst others. The inorganic structure, in contrast to organic structure that help resist tension in bone, inorganic structure helps create a hard, durable structure to resist compression. And that's that. The conclusion of our first lecture that covers chapter six. With our next lecture, we'll consider the ossification process of bone. Specifically, we're going to look at the two mechanisms of bone formation we call endochondral ossification and intramembranous ossification. And then we'll consider how mature bone continues to grow and remodel as a result of hormones and mechanical stressors as we age. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me during office hours. And as always, Make it a great day.